Welcome to the GED Science course from ultimateged.com. This is a complete course designed to help you easily pass the GED. Please watch the full video because we cover everything you need to pass. You can also get our full GED math course with over 250 step-by-step -step videos at ultimateged.com. The Scientific Method and Introduction to GED Graphs Read the passage and graph and answer the questions below. A group of scientists wants to study the effect of temperature on the hatching of turtle eggs. They collect turtle eggs from a beach and incubate them at different temperatures to see if there is a correlation between temperature and the time it takes for the eggs to hatch. Their results are shown in the graph below. Question 1. Which step of the scientific method involves collecting turtle eggs from a beach and incubating them at different temperatures? A. Observation B. Hypothesis C. Experimentation D. Conclusion To answer questions like this, you need to be familiar with the scientific method. You can check out a full lesson on the scientific method on ultimateged.com. The scientific method is a systematic approach used by scientists to investigate natural phenomena and acquire new knowledge. The method involves making observations about a natural phenomenon, forming an hypothesis that is formulating a testable explanation or prediction based on the observations, designing and conducting experiments to test the hypothesis, analyzing and interpreting the data obtained from the experiments, and drawing a conclusion based on the results. Please note that there are different variations of these steps, but the idea is always the same. The most common one is the addition of communication as the last step. For this question, the correct answer is C, experimentation. This step involves designing and conducting experiments to test the hypothesis formulated. In this case, the scientists are manipulating the temperature of the eggs to determine if it has an effect on the time it takes for them to hatch. Question 2. What is the independent variable in the study of the effect of temperature on the hatching of turtle eggs? A. Time to hatch. B. Temperature. C. Type of turtle. D. Location of beach. The correct answer is B. Temperature. To be good in this section of the GED, you must be able to identify the dependent and independent variables. Independent variables and dependent variables are two types of variables used in scientific investigations. The independent variable is the variable that is manipulated or changed by the experimenter to observe its effect on the dependent variable. On the other hand, the dependent variable is the variable that is being measured or observed and is affected by the independent variable. In other words, the independent variable is the cause or predictor of the outcome, while the dependent variable is the effect or the outcome being measured. For example, in the study of the effect of temperature on the hatching of turtle eggs, the independent variable is the temperature, which is being manipulated by the experimenter, while the dependent variable is the time it takes for the eggs to hatch, which is being observed and measured. The experimenter is interested in observing how changes in the independent variable, temperature, affect changes in the dependent variable, time to hatch. Question 3. What conclusion can be drawn from the graph? A. Higher temperatures result in faster hatching times. B. Lower temperatures result in faster hatching times. C. There is no correlation between temperature and hatching time. D. More data is needed to draw a conclusion. Before we answer this question, Let's have a quick lesson on graphs. You can learn more from ultimateged.com. The title of the graph tells us what the graph is about. The x-axis, which is the horizontal axis, is usually the independent variable. So in question two, we could have used the graph to answer it. The y-axis, which is the vertical axis, is usually the dependent variable. Graphs of this form are read from left to right. The slope of the line determines if the line is increasing or decreasing. For this graph, we can say that there's a decrease in the time to hatch when the temperature increased from 25 to 27 degrees Celsius. 
and time to hatch continues to decrease as you increase the temperature. This means our answer is A. Higher temperatures result in faster hatching times. Question 4. Based on the graph, which temperature resulted in the shortest time to hatch? A. 25 degrees Celsius B. 29 degrees Celsius C. 35 degrees Celsius D. 31 degrees Celsius The correct answer is C. 35 degrees. The work here is to locate the point with the shortest time. That point will be this. Then look for the temperature that corresponds to it. That temperature is 35 degrees. Please note that it's not always possible to get exact values on a graph. You need to make your best guess. For a point like this, if we want to find the number of days, the exact value has not been given. We can estimate it to be 53. It's above 50 and below 60. Lesson 2. Units, Measurements, and Conversions Question 5. A car is traveling at a speed of 60 miles per hour. What is the speed of the car in kilometers per hour? A. 96.54 kilometers per hour. B. 100 kilometers per hour. C. 120 kilometers per hour. D. 160.93 kilometers per hour. To pass the GED science, it's important you know your conversions. To convert miles per hour to kilometers per hour, we can use the conversion factor 1 mile equals 1.609 kilometers. This conversion factor will be given to you on the GED. Therefore, to convert 60 miles per hour to kilometers per hour, we can just multiply 60 by 1.609. This gives us a speed of approximately 96.54 kilometers per hour. So the correct answer is A. The table below shows the temperature in degrees Fahrenheit from Monday to Sunday of a small town on the East Coast. Use the table to answer the following question. Question 6. What was the temperature in degrees Celsius for the highest temperature of the week? A. 36.70 B. 25.56 C. 29.25 D. 32.45 From the table, the highest temperature of the week was 78 degrees Fahrenheit. This is in degrees Fahrenheit. However, we are supposed to calculate it in degrees Celsius. The formula is stated above as temperature in degrees Celsius equals temperature in degrees Fahrenheit minus 32 times 5 over 9. Temperature in degrees Celsius equals 78 minus 32 times 5 over 9. 78 minus 32 is 46. So we have 46 times 5 over 9. We can work this out on the calculator to get 25.56. The answer is therefore option B, 25.56 degrees Celsius. Lesson 3. Properties of Life and Cellular Biology Question 7. Which of the following is not one of the characteristics of living organisms? A. Homeostasis B. Metabolism C. Reproduction D. Evolution The correct answer is evolution. The seven characteristics are organization, energy utilization, homeostasis, growth and development, reproduction, adaptation, and response to stimuli. Check out ultimateged.com for more on this. Question 8. Which of the following best describes the relationship between the characteristics of living organisms and the properties of life? A. The seven characteristics are distinct from the properties of life. B. The seven characteristics are examples of the properties of life. C. The seven characteristics are unrelated to the properties of life. D. The properties of life are only relevant to non-living matter. The correct answer is B. The seven characteristics are examples of the properties of life. 
These properties of life and the characteristics of living organisms are often confused and mostly interchanged. There is a difference. The properties of life is what all living organisms have. The characteristics of living organism is how an individual living organism exhibit that property. You can basically call it examples. Let's take the property of life that is metabolism. Both fish and birds have metabolism as a property of life, which refers to the chemical processes that occur within their bodies to convert nutrients into energy and carry out life-sustaining functions. However, fish and birds have different metabolic rates and processes due to their distinct lifestyles and habitats. Fish are cold-blooded, which means they cannot regulate their body temperature internally and instead rely on the temperature of their environment to regulate their metabolism. As a result, their metabolism slows down in colder temperatures and speeds up in warmer temperatures. In contrast, birds are warm-blooded, which means they have the ability to regulate their body temperature internally through metabolism. Birds have a high metabolic rate to generate the heat required to maintain their body temperature, which is typically higher than that of fish. In summary, both fish and birds have metabolism as a property of life, but their metabolic rates and processes differ based on their distinct lifestyles and habitats, meaning their metabolism characteristics are different. Question 9. What is the name of the organelle labeled X in the diagram? A. Nucleus B. Lysosome C. Mitochondrion D. Endoplasmic reticulum The answer is A. Nucleus You need a working knowledge of plant and animal cells. You should be able to identify and label the major organelles. This is an animal cell and here are the organelles. Pause the video and go through it. Question 10. What is the function of the cell membrane? A. To store genetic information. B. To support the cell structure. C. To protect the cell from pathogens. D. To control the movement of substances into and out of the cell. The correct answer is D. To control the movement of substances into and out of the cell. For the GED, you are expected to know the functions of the organelles. Please don't spend too much time memorizing them. You just need a good idea of what they are. The cell membrane is a thin, flexible barrier that surrounds the cell. Its main function is to control the movement of substances into and out of the cell, while also providing protection and support for the cell. Question 11. Which of the following cell types is responsible for producing antibodies to fight infections? A. Red blood cells B. White blood cells C. Muscle cells D. Nerve cells The correct answer is B. White blood cells White blood cells, also known as leukocytes, are responsible for producing antibodies to fight infections. Antibodies are proteins that recognize and bind to foreign substances, such as viruses or bacteria, and mark them for destruction by other cells of the immune system. Red blood cells, A, do not have a nucleus and are not involved in immune responses. They are responsible for carrying oxygen from the lungs to the body's tissues. Muscle cells, C, are specialized cells that are involved in movement and do not have a role in producing antibodies. Nerve cells, D, are specialized cells that are involved in transmitting signals throughout the body and do not have a role in producing antibodies. Lesson 4. Genetics and Heredity Read the passage and answer the question below. Traits are inherited characteristics that are passed down from parents to offspring through genetic material. Some traits are controlled by a single gene, while others are influenced by multiple genes and environmental factors. One example of a single gene trait is the ability to roll your tongue, which is determined by a single gene with two possible versions or alleles. If an individual inherits at least one copy of the dominant allele for tongue rolling, they will be able to roll their tongue. 
However, if they inherit two copies of the recessive allele, they will not be able to roll their tongue. Another example of a trait influenced by multiple genes and environmental factors is height. While genes play a role in determining an individual's height, factors such as nutrition and physical activity can also have an impact. Question 12. What is an example of a single gene trait? A. Eye color. B. Height. C. Skin tone. D. Tongue rolling ability. The correct answer is D. Tongue rolling ability. The passage provides tongue rolling ability as an example of a single gene trait that is determined by a single gene with two possible versions, or alleles. Question 13. If one parent is heterozygous for tongue rolling ability and the other parent is homozygous recessive for this trait, what is the probability that their offspring will be able to roll their tongue? A. 0%. B. 25%. C. 50%. D. 75%. The correct answer is C. 50%. Since genetics is a very important topic on the GED science, let's spend some time learning how we got the 50%. When we talk about genetics, we use the terms heterozygous, homozygous dominant, and homozygous recessive to describe the different possible genotypes for this trait. Heterozygous refers to having two different alleles for a particular gene. In the case of tongue rolling ability, the dominant allele determines the ability to roll the tongue while the recessive allele results in the inability to roll the tongue. Therefore, an individual who is heterozygous for tongue rolling ability would have the genotype, indicating that they have one copy of the dominant allele and one copy of the recessive allele. Homozygous dominant refers to having two identical copies of the dominant allele. In the case of tongue rolling ability, an individual who is homozygous dominant would have the genotype, indicating that they have two copies of the dominant allele and are able to roll their tongue. Homozygous recessive refers to having two identical copies of the recessive allele. In the case of tongue rolling ability, an individual who is homozygous recessive would have the genotype, indicating that they have two copies of the recessive allele and are unable to roll their tongue. Now, let's use this information to answer the question. If one parent is heterozygous for tongue rolling ability, let's say the father, and the other parent is homozygous recessive, let's say the mother, we can use a Punnett square to determine the possible genotypes and phenotypes of their offspring. Here is an example Punnett square for this cross. Let's put the father's genotype here. Let's put the mother's genotype here. You can interchange them. It won't make a difference. The first section will be the dominant R and recessive R. We got that because of this R here and this R here. We do that for the next section. This and this will give us a dominant R and a recessive R. We go to the third section. We have two recessive R. This is because of this R and this R. Then we fill up the last section. Same idea. We have two recessive R. If the offspring is heterozygous or homozygous dominant, they will be able to roll their tongue. Here we have two possibilities of heterozygous. This is out of four total possibilities. This is 2 over 4, which can be reduced to 1 over 2. This is the same as 50%. Lesson 5. Evolution and Natural Selection Read the passage and answer the question below. Birds are a diverse group of animals that have evolved a wide range of adaptations in response to their environment. One example of natural selection in birds is the evolution of beak size and shape. In the Galapagos Islands, finches with different beak sizes and shapes have adapted to different food sources. For example, finches with longer, narrower beaks are better adapted to feeding on insects, while finches with shorter, Rotter beaks are better adapted to cracking seeds. During times of drought, when food sources become scarce, finches with beaks better suited to available food sources are more likely to survive and reproduce, passing on their genes to the next generation. Over time, 
This process can lead to the evolution of new species with distinct beak sizes and shapes. Question 14. What is natural selection and how does it contribute to evolution? A. Natural selection is the process by which individuals with certain traits are more likely to survive and reproduce than individuals without those traits. B. Natural selection is the process by which individuals pass on their genetic material to the next generation. C. Natural selection is the process by which individuals adapt to their environment. D. Natural selection is the process by which individuals change over time in response to changes in their environment. The correct answer is A. Natural selection is the process by which individuals with certain traits are more likely to survive and reproduce than individuals without those traits. The passage defines natural selection as the process by which individuals with certain advantageous traits are more likely to survive and reproduce, passing on their genes to the next generation. Over time, this process can lead to the evolution of new species with distinct characteristics. Question 15. What is an example of natural selection in birds? A. The evolution of flight feathers. B. The development of colorful plumage. C. The evolution of beak size and shape. D. The migration patterns of birds. The correct answer is C. The evolution of beak size and shape. The passage describes the evolution of beak size and shape in finches as an example of an adaptation in birds that has occurred through natural selection. Question 16. How do finches with beaks better suited to available food sources during a drought contribute to evolutionary change? A. They are more likely to develop longer lifespans. B. They are more likely to mate with birds with similar beak sizes and shapes. C. They are more likely to survive and reproduce, passing on their genes to the next generation. D. They are more likely to develop new adaptations that make them better suited to their environment. The answer is C. They are more likely to survive and reproduce, passing on their genes to the next generation. During times of drought, when food sources become scarce, finches with beaks better suited to available food sources are more likely to survive and reproduce. This is because they are better able to obtain food, which gives them a competitive advantage over finches with less suitable beaks. As a result, the genes that determine beak size and shape are more likely to be passed on to the next generation, and the frequency of these genes in the population will increase over time. This process is called natural selection and can lead to the evolution of new species with distinct beak sizes and shapes that are better adapted to their environment. Part 2. Please watch the full video and all parts so you can cover all the topics you need to pass. Let's dive right in. Lesson 6. Ecology and Classification In a small grassland ecosystem, a variety of organisms interact and depend on one another for survival. At the base of the food chain, grass absorbs sunlight and converts it into energy through photosynthesis, serving as a primary source of nourishment for herbivores. Grasshoppers, which are primary consumers, feed on the grass, obtaining energy and nutrients. As secondary consumers, frogs prey on the grasshoppers, transferring energy up the food chain. In turn, Snakes, tertiary consumers, hunt frogs as their source of energy. At the top of the food chain, hawks, quaternary consumers, capture and consume snakes, which are their primary prey. This food chain demonstrates the interconnectedness of the grassland ecosystem as energy flows from one organism to another, forming a cycle that supports life at all trophic levels. The diagram shows this interaction. Question 17. Which organism in the provided food chain is a primary consumer? A. Grass B. Grasshopper C. Frog D. Snake The correct answer is B. Grasshopper Please do not confuse the primary consumer with the producer. The primary consumer is an organism that feeds directly on producers, in this case the grass, Producers convert sunlight into energy through the process of photosynthesis, and primary consumers consume these producers to obtain energy and nutrients.
Question 18. In the grassland food chain mentioned earlier, which organism is a secondary consumer? A. Grass. B. Grasshopper. C. Frog. D. Snake. The correct answer is C. Frog. In the grassland food chain, the frog preys on the grasshopper, which is a primary consumer. Since the frog obtains its energy and nutrients by feeding on the primary consumer, it is considered a secondary consumer in the food chain. Question 19. What is the purpose of classification and taxonomy in biology? A. To identify and name new species. B. To understand the evolutionary history and relationships among organisms. C. To determine the geographic distribution of organisms. D. To study the physical characteristics of organisms. The correct answer is B. To understand the evolutionary history and relationships among organisms. The purpose of classification and taxonomy in biology is to organize living organisms based on their evolutionary history and relationships to each other. This allows scientists to better understand the diversity of life and how different species are related to each other. Question 20. Match the following animals with their respective taxonomic classes. Sharks, penguins, salamanders, butterflies, crocodiles. For questions on taxonomy, the animals used are usually going to be familiar animals. Start by matching the ones that are obvious to you and continue from there. For this question, sharks are a type of fish. Penguins are birds. Salamanders are amphibians. Butterflies are insects. And crocodiles are reptiles. During a field trip to a local pond, students observed and identified various organisms belonging to different taxonomic groups. The goal of the field trip was to understand the biodiversity and distribution of these organisms within the pond ecosystem. After careful observation and documentation, the students found that the pond was inhabited by 20% fish, 30% amphibians, 25% birds, and the rest were insects. They decided to represent this data in the form of a pie chart to visualize the percentage of each taxonomic group present in the pond ecosystem. Based on this information, answer the following questions. Question 21. According to the students' observations at the pond, which taxonomic group has the highest percentage of organisms in the pond ecosystem? A. Fish. B. Amphibians. C. Birds. D. Insects. The correct answer is B. Amphibians. Pie chats are another form of graphs that you need to be familiar with for the GED. For this question, you can just observe the pie chat and notice that the pie for the amphibians is the largest. Eyeballing is always your first option. Eyeballing might not work for values that are very close. Calculation is your second option. To answer this question, you need to know the percentage of organisms that are insects, since that was not given in the passage. A full pie chat represents 100%. To get the percentage that are insects, we will subtract 100 minus the percentage of fish, which is 20, minus the percentage of amphibians, which is 30, minus the percentage of birds, which is 25. This will give us 25% as the percentage of insects. Now that we have all the percentages, we can see that the amphibians, which is 30%, is the highest. Question 22. If the students observed a total of 200 individual organisms during their field trip to the pond, how many of these organisms were fish? A. 20. B. 40. C. 60. D. 80. The correct answer is B. 40. On a pie chat, you can be given percentages or the actual values. You should know how to convert between the two. For this pie chat, we are given the percentages. This question is asking us to find the actual value of the fish. To do this, we have to find 20% of the total 200 since the percentage of fish is 20%. 20% is the same as 20 over 100. 
of in math means multiplication. Then we have our 200. We can now work this calculation out to get 40 as our answer. Read the passage and answer the questions below. In the tropical rainforest, a diverse array of species exist in a complex food web. At the base of the food chain are primary consumers, such as insects and rodents, which feed on plants and other vegetation. These primary consumers are in turn eaten by secondary consumers, such as birds and small mammals. Finally, there are tertiary consumers, such as large cats and snakes, which feed on the secondary consumers. Each level of the food chain is important to maintaining the balance of the ecosystem, and changes in one level can have ripple effects throughout the food web. Question 23. What is the primary source of food for primary consumers in the tropical rainforest ecosystem? A. Other animals. B. Rocks and minerals. C. Sunlight. D. Plants and other vegetation. The correct answer is D. Plants and other vegetation. The passage states that primary consumers in the tropical rainforest ecosystem feed on plants and other vegetation. This is because they are herbivores, meaning they obtain their energy and nutrients from consuming plants. Question 24. Give an example of a tertiary consumer in the tropical rainforest ecosystem. A. A butterfly. B. A toucan. C. A jaguar. D. A monkey. The correct answer is C. A jaguar. The passage states that tertiary consumers in the tropical rainforest ecosystem are animals that feed on secondary consumers. Jaguars are an example of a tertiary consumer in this ecosystem as they primarily feed on smaller mammals such as monkeys, deer, and rodents. Question 25. What would happen if there were a sudden decrease in the population of primary consumers in the tropical rainforest ecosystem? A. The population of secondary consumers would increase. B. The population of secondary consumers would decrease. C. The population of tertiary consumers would decrease. D. The ecosystem would not be affected. The correct answer is B. The population of secondary consumers would decrease. The passage explains that each level of the food chain is important to maintaining the balance of the ecosystem, and changes in one level can have ripple effects throughout the food web. If the population of primary consumers were to suddenly decrease, there would be less food available for the secondary consumers that rely on them for food. This would likely result in a decrease in the population of secondary consumers. Choice C is also correct if you look at the ripple effects, but B is a better choice in this question. Lesson 7 Human Anatomy, Physiology, and Health Question 26. What is the function of the circulatory system? A. To transport oxygen and nutrients to cells and remove waste products. B. To control movement and support the body. C. To exchange gases with the environment. D. To provide structure and protection for the body. The correct answer is A to transport oxygen and nutrients to cells and remove waste products. To pass the GED, you'll need an idea of what the organ systems are. The circulatory system is responsible for transporting oxygen and nutrients to cells and removing waste products, such as carbon dioxide, from the body. Other organ systems are Respiratory system This system is responsible for bringing oxygen into the body and removing carbon dioxide. Digestive system. The digestive system processes food and extracts nutrients from it. Nervous system. This system controls and coordinates the body's responses to internal and external stimuli. Endocrine system. The endocrine system produces and releases hormones that regulate various bodily functions. Muscular system. This system allows the body to move and maintain posture. Skeletal system. The skeletal system provides support for the body and protects internal organs. Integumentary system. 
This system is responsible for protecting the body from external damage and regulating temperature. Question 27. What is the role of the respiratory system? A. To break down food and absorb nutrients. B. To eliminate waste products from the body. C. To transport oxygen and nutrients to cells. D. To exchange gases with the environment. The correct answer is D. To exchange gases with the environment. The respiratory system is responsible for exchanging gases with the environment, specifically oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen is brought into the body and carbon dioxide is removed. Question 28. What is the difference between voluntary and involuntary muscles? A. Voluntary muscles are only found in the arms and legs, while involuntary muscles are found in the internal organs. B. Voluntary muscles are controlled consciously, while involuntary muscles are controlled automatically by the nervous system. C. Voluntary muscles are found in the heart, while involuntary muscles are found in the limbs. D. Voluntary muscles are responsible for maintaining posture, while involuntary muscles are responsible for movement. The correct answer is B. Voluntary muscles are controlled consciously, while involuntary muscles are controlled automatically by the nervous system. Voluntary muscles are under conscious control, meaning that they are controlled by the brain and can be moved at will. Involuntary muscles, on the other hand, are controlled automatically by the nervous system and cannot be consciously controlled. Question 29. What is the function of the immune system? A. To transport oxygen and nutrients to cells and remove waste products. B. To control movement and support the body. C. To exchange gases with the environment. D. To defend the body against pathogens and foreign substances. The correct answer is D. To defend the body against pathogens and foreign substances. The immune system is responsible for defending the body against pathogens, such as viruses and bacteria, and foreign substances, such as toxins and allergens. Question 30. What is the difference between a virus and a bacterium? A. Viruses are larger than bacteria. B. Bacteria can reproduce outside of a host organism, while viruses cannot. C. Bacteria are the cause of all infectious diseases, while viruses are not harmful to humans. D. Viruses are only found in animals, while bacteria are found in all living organisms. The correct answer is B. Bacteria can reproduce outside of a host organism, while viruses cannot. Bacteria are single-celled microorganisms that can reproduce independently, while viruses are not alive and must infect living cells to reproduce. Lesson 8. Matter, Properties, States, and Phase Changes Question 31. The information below describes the properties of two substances. Which substance is denser? Substance A is 20 grams and has a volume of 10 cm cubed. Substance B is 15 grams and has a volume of 5 cm cubed. A substance A, B, substance B, C, both substances have the same density. D, cannot be determined from the information given. Density is calculated by dividing the mass of a substance by its volume. Therefore, the density of substance A is 20 grams divided by 10 centimeters cubed. This is equal to 2 grams per centimeter cubed. The density of substance B is 15 grams divided by 5 centimeter cubed. This will be equal to 3 grams per centimeter cubed. Since B is greater than A, it means substance B is dense than substance A. So the correct answer is B. Question 32. What is the phase change that occurs when a solid becomes a gas? A. Condensation. B. Melting. C. Freezing. D. Sublimation. The correct answer is D, sublimation. 
Sublimation is the phase change that occurs when a solid changes directly to a gas without first becoming a liquid. Examples of substances that undergo sublimation include dry ice, that is solid carbon dioxide, and mothballs, that is solid naphthalene. Let's look at what the other things mean. It's important to know them. Condensation is the phase change in which a gas turns into a liquid. Melting is the phase change in which a solid turns into a liquid. Freezing is the phase change in which a liquid turns into a solid. Question 33. Which of the following is an example of a physical property of matter? A. Flammability. B. Reactivity. C. Density. D. pH. The correct answer is C. Density. Physical properties of matter are characteristics that can be observed or measured without changing the composition of the substance. Examples of physical properties include density, color, texture, and melting point. Flammability, reactivity, and pH are examples of chemical properties, which describe how a substance interacts with other substances to form new substances. Thanks for joining us for part three of our GED science course from ultimateged.com. Part three and part four will have most of our GED science calculations. Let's dive right in. Lesson nine, atomic theory, structure, and the periodic table. The table in the corresponding graph displays various properties of selected elements. The table lists the atomic number and number of protons of each element, while the graph displays the electronegativity values of the elements. Use these to answer the following questions. Question 34. Which of the statements below is true? A. The atomic number is equal to the number of electrons in the atom. B. The atomic number is equal to the number of neutrons in the atom. C. The atomic number is equal to the sum of the number of protons and neutrons in the atom. D. The atomic number is equal to the number of protons in the atom. Some GED science questions requires the use of multiple data points, like two graphs or a graph and a table combined to get your answers. That's what we are looking at here. The correct answer is D. The atomic number is equal to the number of protons in the atom. This first question is pretty straightforward. We can see from the table that the atomic number is always the same as the number of protons. Question 35. How does the electronegativity trend vary among the elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine? A. Electronegativity decreases from carbon to fluorine. B. Electronegativity increases from carbon to fluorine. C. Electronegativity remains constant among carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. D. There is no clear trend in electronegativity among carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. The correct answer is B. Electronegativity increases from carbon to fluorine. This is pretty easy. We can see from the graph that the electronegativity values are increasing on this graph as you move from carbon to fluorine. Question 36. Which of the following is true about elements in the same group on the periodic table? A. They have similar atomic masses. B. They have similar electronegativities. C. They have the same number of electrons. D. They have similar chemical properties. The correct answer is D. They have similar chemical properties. Elements in the same group on the periodic table have the same number of valence electrons, which determines their chemical properties. Valence electrons are simply the electrons in the outermost shell or energy level of an atom. For example, elements in group 1, such as lithium, sodium, and potassium, all have one valence electron and are highly reactive with other elements. From these images, you can see that although these elements have different number of electrons, they all have just one electron on the last shell. Please check out ultimateged.com for more lessons on the atomic structure. Question 37. Which of the following subatomic particles are typically found in the nucleus of an atom? Proton 
neutron, electron. The correct answer is proton and neutron. In the previous question, we used a simple diagram to represent an atom because we only cared about the shells. This diagram here is a better representation of an atom. Both protons and neutrons are typically found in the nucleus of an atom. Protons have a positive charge, while neutrons have no charge, they are neutral. Electrons, on the other hand, are not found in the nucleus but orbit around it in energy levels or shells. Lesson 10. Chemical bonding, reactions, and stoichiometry. Question 38. What is the balanced chemical equation for the reaction between hydrogen gas and oxygen gas to form water? A. 2H2 reacts with O2 to get H2O. B. H2O breaks down to 2H2 and O2. C. 2H2 reacts with O2 to give 2H2O. D. 2H2O breaks down to H2 and O2. The correct answer is C. Two molecules of hydrogen gas react with one molecule of oxygen gas to produce two molecules of water. Balancing equations is one of the most important things on the GED. Our work here is to make sure that there are equal numbers of atoms of each element on both sides of the equation. On the left side, there are four atoms of hydrogen. That is the two times this two. For the oxygen, there are two atoms. On the right side, please note that this two affect both the hydrogen and oxygen. So there are four atoms of hydrogen, which is this two times this two and there are two atoms of oxygen because of this too. So we can see that there are the same amount of hydrogen and oxygen on both sides of the equation so it is balanced. Please go to ultimateged.com and try on your hands on more examples. This requires practicing. Question 39. What is the coefficient for the oxygen gas in the balanced chemical equation for the combustion of propane to form carbon dioxide and water? A2, B3, C4, D5. The correct answer is D5. The work here is to make sure that the number of atoms of oxygen are the same on both sides of the equation. We need to find all the oxygen on the right side and make sure that there are the same number of molecules on the left side. On the right side, oxygen is found in the carbon dioxide and the water. For the carbon dioxide, we have 3 times 2. Remember we said that this 3 multiplies both the carbon and the oxygen. This will give us 6 atoms of oxygen. For the water, we have 4 times 1. This will give us 4. Again, remember the preceding 4 multiplies both the hydrogen and the oxygen. The total number of oxygen atoms is therefore 10. To balance it out, we need 10 atoms of oxygen on the left side so we can put five molecules here. The five will multiply the two to get 10. Now the molecules of oxygen is the same on both sides, so it is balanced. Please, it's important you practice more examples on this. Lesson 11, thermodynamics and heat transfer. Carla and Mark are chemistry students who are conducting an experiment to study the effects of heat transfer in chemical reactions. They mix two substances together in a beaker and notice that the temperature of the mixture increases. Carla explains that this reaction is exothermic because it releases heat into the surroundings. Mark is curious and asks if there are any reactions that absorb heat. Carla nods and suggests they mix another set of substances to demonstrate an endothermic reaction. They mix the second set of substances together and notice that the temperature of the mixture decreases confirming that it is endothermic. Question 40. How can you tell if a reaction is exothermic or endothermic? A. By measuring the temperature change of the reaction. B. By measuring the weight of the reactants and products. C. By measuring the volume of the reactants and products. D. By measuring the color change of the reaction. The correct answer is A. By measuring the temperature change of the reaction. In the passage, Carla and Mark were able to determine whether a reaction was exothermic or endothermic 
by observing the temperature change of the mixture. This is part four of our GED science course. Please, it's important you watch the entire playlist of four videos. We cover all the major topics you need to pass the GED science. Don't forget to check out ultimateged.com for more. Let's dive in. Mechanics, fluid dynamics, and properties of gas. Mike releases a ball from rest at the top of a ramp. The ball rolls down the ramp due to gravity and its kinetic energy increases as it accelerates. By the time the ball reaches the bottom of the ramp, it has gained 5 joules of kinetic energy. The relationship between gravitational potential energy and kinetic energy for an object moving solely under the influence of gravity is Potential energy lost equals kinetic energy gained. Question 41. If the ball started from a height h meters and its weight is 10 newtons, how high is the ramp? A. 0 0.25 meters. B. 0 0.5 meters. C. 1.0 meters. D. 2.0 meters. The correct answer is B. 0 0.5 meters. For questions in this section, all the formulas will be given to you but you'll have to understand the relationship of the information in order to solve. The potential energy due to gravity is given by the formula weight times height. So to find the height, we need to know the weight and the potential energy. The weight has been given to us as 10 newtons. The potential energy has not been given to us. However, the kinetic energy gained has been given to us as 5 joules. We know that the potential energy lost is the same as the kinetic energy gained. So the potential energy will also be 5 joules. We have 5 equals 10 times h. We can now solve for h. Divide both sides by 10. The 10 will cancel out. 5 divided by 10 is 0 0.5. So the height is 0 0.5 meters. Question 42. A container holds a fixed amount of an ideal gas. If the pressure of the gas in the container is doubled while keeping the volume and number of moles constant, what happens to the temperature of the gas? The ideal gas law is PV equals nRT, where P is pressure, V is volume, N is the number of moles, R is the gas constant, and T is temperature. A. It remains the same. B it is halved. C. It doubles. D. It quadruples. The correct answer is C. It doubles. Please do not overthink on GED calculation questions or questions like this. They are usually designed to test your ability to recognize patterns and relationships and accurately interpret and use formulas. For this question, all we have to keep in mind is that it is an equation. To keep it equal, Whatever you do to one side must be done to the other side. We are told that the pressure is doubled, so we can multiply pressure by 2. To balance the equation we have to multiply something on the right side by 2. We are told that the volume and number of moles are constant, so we cannot do anything to it. R is also a constant. It is the gas constant. To balance it we can only multiply the temperature by 2. This means that the temperature doubles. Lesson 13. Waves, Electricity, and Magnetism. Question 43. A sound wave has a frequency of 500 hertz and a wavelength of 0 0.68 meters. What is the speed of sound in meters per second? A. 340 meters per second. B. 500 meters per second. C. 680 meters per second. D. 850 meters per second. The correct answer is A. 340 meters per second. The speed of sound in air can be calculated using the formula V equals F time lambda, where V is the speed, F is the frequency, and lambda is the wavelength. This formula, as always, will be given to you on the test. Your work is just applying it. We have been given the frequency as 500 and the wavelength as 0.68. Plugging in the values, 
we get B equals 500 times 0.68. This will give us 340 meters per second. Question 4 to 4. A circuit with a resistance of 10 ohms is connected to a 12 volt power source. What is the current flowing through the circuit? A. 0.12 amperes. B. 1.2 amperes. C. 12 amperes. D. 120 amperes. The correct answer is B. 1.2 amperes. This is another formula work. We will be using Ohm's law, V equals IR, where V is voltage, I is current, and R is resistance. This formula will be given to you. We have been given the voltage as 12. We've also been given the resistance as 10. Our work is to solve for I, divide both sides by the 10. The 10 will cancel out. 12 divided by 10 is 1.2. Therefore, the current flowing through the circuit is 1.2 amperes. Lesson 14. Earth and Space Science In the desert of the American Southwest, a stunning geological feature draws scientists and tourists alike. This feature, known as the Red Rock Canyon, showcases layers of sedimentary rock, predominantly sandstone, that have been sculpted by wind and water over millions of years. The striking red color of the rock is due to the presence of iron oxide, or rust, which has stained the sandstone over time. Geologists are particularly interested in the canyon's rock formations, which provide a window into Earth's geological history. Fossilized remains of ancient plants and animals have been discovered within these layers, offering clues about the region's past environments. The canyon's unique topography also reveals the powerful forces of erosion, which have shaped the landscape into its current form. Question 45. What causes the red color of the rocks in Red Rock Canyon? A. High quartz content. B. Presence of iron oxide. C. Erosion by water. D. Volcanic activity. The correct answer is B. The presence of iron oxide. From the passage, we know that the striking red color of the rock is due to the presence of iron oxide, or rust, which has stained the sandstone over time. Question 46. Which type of rock is formed by the cooling and solidifying of magma or lava? A. Sedimentary. B. Igneous. C. Metamorphic. D. Limestone. The correct answer is B. Igneous rocks. Igneous rocks are formed from the solidification and cooling of magma or lava. Common examples are granite and basalt. It's important you know the other types of rocks. Sedimentary rocks. These are formed from the accumulation or deposition of mineral and organic particles, often in water bodies like rivers, lakes, and oceans. An example is sandstone and shale. Metamorphic rocks. These rocks are formed from the transformation of existing rock types in a process known as metamorphism, which means change in form. Examples include slate, formed from shale, and marble, formed from limestone. Limestone, this is actually a specific type of rock, typically a sedimentary rock, rather than a category of rock. Limestone is primarily composed of the mineral calcite, calcium carbonate, and forms largely in aquatic environments from the accumulation of shells, coral, algae, and other organic materials. Question 47. Which of the following planets is known as the red planet due to its reddish appearance? A. Venus. B. Mercury. C. Mars. D. Jupiter. The correct answer is C. Mars. Mars is commonly referred to as the red planet because of its distinct reddish hue. This coloration is due to the presence of iron oxide, or rust, on its surface. It's important you know some basic information about planets. Like what planet has a ring? What planets are closet to Earth? Lesson 15. Environmental Science and Sustainability Question 48. 
What is the primary cause of the current trend in global warming and climate change? A. Decrease in volcanic activity. B. Increase in solar radiation. C. Decrease in ocean currents. D. Increase in greenhouse gas emissions. The correct answer is D. Increase in greenhouse gas emissions. These gases, which include carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, trap heat in the Earth's atmosphere, leading to a warming effect known as the greenhouse effect. Question 49. Which of the following is a consequence of climate change that affects coastal communities? A. Increased soil fertility. B. Decreased hurricane activity. C. Rising sea levels. D. Decreased rainfall in desert. The correct answer is C. Rising sea levels. As global temperatures rise, polar ice caps and glaciers melt, contributing to higher sea levels. Additionally, the warming of the ocean leads to thermal expansion of water, further elevating sea levels. This results in increased coastal erosion, flooding, and can even lead to the displacement of communities. It also threatens important ecosystems such as mangroves and coral reefs. Question 50. Sustainable development primarily aims to a. Maximize short-term economic growth b. Use resources to meet human needs while preserving the environment for future generations c. Focus solely on conservation of natural resources. D. Promote industrialization at any cost. The correct answer is B. Use resources to meet human needs while preserving the environment for future generations. The goal is to use resources in a way that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Get more. Watch the GED Science Playlist. GED Math Playlist and get the full GED Math course.